So hello everyone, welcome to today's uh, talk about the emer newly emerging book <coughs> which is called The Emerging Contours of the Medium, Literature and Mediality. And it is my uh, pleasure to invite uh, my special guests from NYU um, who will join us in conversation about the book and a kind of improvised, uh, improvised talk. So um, this takes place within a, a workshop, three-day workshop uh, on large language models and the AI research, which uh, is mainly taking place at uh, NYU Prague, uh, 15 minutes walk from here. Uh, but we decided, because Samos also has been part of the Digital Theory Lab since 2020, uh, to uh, sort of include this uh, book talk uh, 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 in, the, in the event. And so I'm also happy to, to welcome a mixture of uh, my colleagues from the Institute and uh, uh, students, of course, uh, doctor students uh, and, uh, and obviously people from, from NYU, from, well, we see who, who, who appears from, <laughs> from, from the workshop because the way, they're on the way, as it seems, but, and, uh, but we are already beginning. So they, people might be wandering in, I think. Um, so um, uh, we the, the the idea is we would have a kind of uh, talk about this, which would be moderated more by Leif and Lisa, um, and uh, then after the talk, that then we would have uh, an an open uh, discussion with the audience. Uh, so after about an hour, we hope to sort of uh, um, give give voice to 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 you and hear what uh, what you what you think. Um, the, so the introduction, I think, also of Lisa Gittleman and uh, if you get whether be, I need to need to make it now. So Lisa Gittleman is an accomplished media historian uh, whose research concerns American print culture, techniques of inscription, and the new media of yesterday and today. She's particularly concerned with tracing the patterns according to which new media become meaningful within and against the contexts of older media. I, I've always liked this uh, formulation. Um, her most recent book is entitled Paper Knowledge Toward a Media History of Documents, <clears throat> which uh, some of you know and actually work with, as I've, I've uh, discovered, and was published uh, by Duke in two, uh, 2014. Um, there are several important books under her belt, including Always Already New, Media History and the Data of Culture. Uh, Lisa teaches at the English Department and at Media, Culture and Communication at NYU. Um, and is a former editor of the Thomas A. Edison Papers at Rutgers University. Uh, Leif Weatherby's uh, research focuses on digital technology, political economy, and German romanticism and idealism. Trained as a comparatist, he's uh, particularly interested in theories of technology that involve both its economic and meaning-making dimensions. His book, Translating the Metaphysical Organ, German Romanticism between Leibniz and Marx, came out in 2016. Uh, his current book project, and I hope this is still uh, true, uh, treats the cybernetics movement as uh, philosophy. Um, he's the founder of the Digital Theory Lab at NYU and teaches at the German department. Uh, so I should also mention that uh, we meet here um, as uh, with uh, people with uh, different disciplinary backgrounds. So this will be also a dialogue between representatives of media history, media theory, philosophy, history of technology, history of knowledge perhaps, uh, and other fields that uh, sometimes communicate but often uh, often do not. Um, and also I have to introduce my colleague uh, Josef Shebek, whom many of you know or most of you probably know. He's an assistant professor at the Department of Czech and Comparative Literature uh, uh, of the Faculty of Arts of Charles University. He specializes in cultural materialism, the sociology of Pierre Bourdieu and current French uh, sociology of literature 
and works also on contemporary theory of discourse and rhetoric, media theory of literature, genres of life writing, and queer studies. Among other publications, he's the author of the book Literature and the Social, Bourdieu, Williams, and their successors, which was published, I think, in 2020. 11. 11. Uh, 19, what? sorry. 19, okay. <laughs> well, that was, uh, he's also the managing editor of the journals uh, Word and Sense. Uh, okay, so um, I should, I have to also mention as a, um, at the beginning that uh, the, the, the book that we are talking about today, uh, well, I have to introduce it, right? <laughs> so, uh, is uh, as I mentioned, called uh, the emerging contours of the medium literature and mediality, and it will be published as we hope, or as the, the recent news is from Bloomsbury, uh, publishing in February twenty-four. Uh, and it's a co-edition between uh, the Institute of the Czech Literature and um, and Bloomsbury, and we will publish within the series called uh, Thinking Media. Um, and welcome, <laughs> hello here. I'm very glad that you made it. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, so that's uh, there's a context, and I have to mention that the uh, the the book is a slimmed uh, and adapted version of this uh, huge beast that you've <laughs> known. Uh, those of you who are who are living here. Um, <laughs> and so we've adapted it, we've, uh, we've reduced the, the size, and still I think it's going to be the largest book in the Thinking Media uh, um, series by, by, by far, but anyway, we tried. And uh, and that it is a, really a, a fruit of a or a, a, a product of an eff of a team effort with, that was going on from 2015 when I began with Tomáš Kudy, who unfortunately cannot be here today, uh, discussing you know me how to connect uh, uh, the, the, the various um, understandings of um, mediality in different traditions and of the concept of the medium. And we started to put this together and then we, were, we, we started to sort of like develop the framework with a further, uh, further people from the Institute, Alice Jedličkova, who works here, Stanislava uh, Fedrova, who also uh, uh, is uh, at the Institute of Art uh, History, and um, and other people um, uh, have joined us, uh, Josef Vojvodík from the Institute of uh, uh, Czech and Comparative Literature from Charles University, uh, and Martin Ritter, from the Philosophical Institute of the Academy of the Sciences. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, I have a sense. Ah, yeah, I did. Yeah, and Miroslav Petříček, uh, uh, professor of uh, philosophy at the Charles uh, University at the Faculty of Arts as well. Um, so we are uh, we are only a um, uh, very slim sort of version of the, <laughs> the author team, but it seems sort of uh, fair to have a two-on-two -two, uh, uh, <laughs> discussion. Um, OK, so I think I will yeah. give Yeah. Thank you. Um, this guy who's been talking so far is uh, Richard Muller, who I think bas basically needs no introduction. But I'm going to do it anyway, because um, I, I mean, we're just so delighted to be here. Um, uh, the Digital Theory Lab has been studying the history of digital technologies and especially neural nets, the new AI, since 2018. And uh, in the winter of 2019-20, uh, Richard joined us and uh, was there in that momentous moment in New York City when everything <laughs> shut down <laughs> um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we sort of uh, all experienced that together in a way. And uh, anyway, uh, Richard is the uh, researcher at the Institute of Czech Literature, the Czech Academy of Sciences, teaches comparative literature at the uh, in the comparative literature program at NYU here in Prague, and at the literary and media program at the Prague School of Creative Communication. Um, his research fields include the contextual transformation of literary mediality, which we're going to hear about in a minute, genealogy of literary and media theory, the writings of Franz Kafka, 
Um, since 2015, he has been editor of the Cheshka Literatura scholarly journal. Sorry if I... Uh, no more. No. Okay, yeah. <laughs> He's also the author of the Dictionary of Modern Literary Theory, Terms and Concepts, and Text and Circulation, Anthology of Culturalist, Cultural Materialist Approaches to Literature. And I have to say just two very quick things. I couldn't be more delighted that there's a book on this topic, which has rarely been done and brought together, and it's perfectly fitting that that should come out of the illustrious history here in Prague and the Prague School, which is addressed in one of the chapters. And second, that it is written in this beautiful collaborative and, and way, which is very much the spirit that we hope to emulate in the lab. So you know, let Lisa take the questions to start. Okay. Um, thanks so much. It's a delight to be here. And um, I'm so glad that we could include this as part of um, our digital school, you know, theory school uh, here in Prague. Um, it's great to be at the Institute too. And I, I wanted to um, offer my congratulations about this book. I mean, it's, it's, it's monumental uh, in Czech and it's going to be important in English when it comes out. Um, so we thought that in the interest of letting you all know what's in it, um, we would um, just ask uh, Joseph and, and Richard to to talk a little bit about what they've accomplished um, uh, in a kind of informal way. So I, I'm going to start and ask with a ask a kind of general question. Um, uh, so in, in the book, and I'm thinking about the way you frame it in the introduction, but also the kind of collaborative conclusion at the end, um, you talk about a kind of conflict in which media scholars in general are reluctant to, to count or to account for literature. And by the same token, um, literary studies has been, or at least used to be, fine without thinking about mediation. Um, so there's kind of a black hole where they cancel each other out. And so I, I wanted to ask you to reflect for all of us on the occasion for your book. You know, why did you write it? Um, uh, what are you, you know, uh, putting together? Uh, and why did you write it now? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks also for, please take your, take the seat. Um, so yeah, so this will be like improvised uh, thoughts and compared to the stuff that we heard at the, at the workshop, this will be much less developed because we're just talking in a different language than is our own and, um, and, and we're kind of improvising. So uh, it's, this is going to be, a, this should be a kind of more informal, uh, informal meeting. Uh, uh, yeah, everyone uh, should get a copy of the contents so that there was our idea that uh, everyone has it. And, uh, Almost everyone. Or at least as, as many people as, uh, as they can. <clears throat> so to the question that uh, Lisa asked, um, so we obviously uh, can see in um, literary criticism here or uh, abroad uh, the, the need to account for various remediations of literature, which change, which seem to change not only, uh, which seem not only to reflect the uh, the the changing character of literature as a, as a media system or as a medium as a as a communication system but also the ways of talking about it and uh, there is i don't know instagram poetry there is ai production there uh, or ai partly ai generated texts um, there is new media e-literature um, and all kinds of approaches distant reading for instance instance and discussion about it. Uh, but at the same time, when uh, we deal with um, uh, the literature as a, as, a, as, a, as a large field which has been historically developing for many uh, hundreds of years, uh, and the concept itself, as, of course, as well, we uh, are this projected back onto that and onto that changing field. Uh, we we uh, do not have a good vocabulary to uh, which would be generated from from these changes to project back onto uh, the older historical periods. Let's say so. Um, there is a certain um, it it is we cannot begin even as like teachers, for instance, because we also teach uh, literary courses. We cannot begin with Instagram poetry or with AI. 
uh, you know. And uh, we, so we do need uh, an older uh, conceptual framework. So we we have not to forget as if what we have known already or always um, in literary theory. But literary theory also is not adapted to the new situation at the same time. So we're dealing with a, a kind of transitional uh, transitional phase, let's say, which acquires a different kind of attention, a different kind of uh, vocabulary, and so on. So it's not only about the concept of the medium, or but of, of like mediality of literature within other media, and it's like transforming uh, status yeah. in the moment. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, what I think is also important and uh, obvious uh, that uh, you know literature, 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 the older literature, not just the new uh, ways of doing literature, the the novels from the nineteenth century, they change as well because of the new media and because of the new environment that is uh, that is uh, that is there so uh, it has been of course uh, you know new media have been emerging uh, for uh, many many uh, many many centuries but it seems uh, that in the last decades it somehow there is some mm, some qualitative change or something like that when literature kind of uh, the the position of literature is kind of becoming not precarious but somehow somehow shaken i would say so uh, of course this is also this can be regarded as you know oh my god uh, literature is no longer no one is interested in it and so on it's not not true i just uh, over um, over emphasizing it but on the other hand it's a uh, it's a good moment. Uh, it's a good moment where one can kind of try to develop a more sus uh, sustained or more more complex theory of what literature possibly could be. Yeah, so, uh, of course, uh, this seems as a good, great goal, uh, which I don't know if he achieved, <laughs> but we kind of wanted to go in this direction. <coughs> <coughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. I'm just going to go a little bit further in the same direction, um, because one of the things you do in the book um, that I was able to read the manuscript really quickly, um, uh, one of the things you sort of set up is a kind of dual genealogy, um, one of you know what, what media are, what the media concept is, um, and then as you've both suggested, um, a genealogy of the literary as well, where literature goes from being simply writing, learning, um, to something much more um, specific and in a sense more precious um, uh, in perhaps a pejorative sense. But um, uh, so I wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit further on um, the, the how these two genealogies hit each other, how they intersect um, uh, and, and kind of how you see that framing your question. Yeah, thanks for this question. So the uh, so the, the, the our clue is the f um, that if we need a new theoretical language, uh, which at the same time doesn't uh, get rid of the older tradition, let's say that we need to um, sort of make them clash, or that we need to um, uh, sort of use uh, sort of both fields. If I just simplify media and literary theory, uh, as if they are on the same, let's say, plane. But this is not something that has been done really systematically. And uh, so a way to uh, sort of like tease out the uh, sort of like media, latent media um, sort of insights in literary theory itself is, uh, b is by uh, looking at it from the point of view of media theory and vice versa uh, to sort of bring these two traditions together even though they have a very different sort of like um, a life, right, or uh, um, length, let's say. And uh, so we need also we, what our, our sort of like approach is that we are very theoretical and uh, uh, which is not very popular <laughs> it seems to me anymore. <laughs> at least in the context of Czech studies. It doesn't seem to be that popular anymore. And uh, so there, there have been many ends of, the, of theory, right? So we are sort of like saying that we need to end the end of, the, of theory. And uh, and uh, that, but what, that we need a theory in a genealogical form, in a, in a way. Uh, so what we're really doing is a kind of like remediation, a remediation of theory. And uh, what we are also finding, like many important 
insights about uh, me, important concepts in uh, important from a media point of view in the tradition of literary theory, which were not read in that way, um, and vice versa. In in media theory, we find uh, so many different concepts of I don't know, let's say evolution of technology technology and its importance uh, in Kittler's work, for instance, its importance for literature. But then um, there is something as as everyone who studied Kittler knows there is something missing for from a point of view of a literary critic or a literary scholar, uh, and that there is a certain reduction of of, uh, of semantics, of science, of uh, meaning making, of um, of interpretation, of experience, of attention, a deliberate uh, um, pushing of these dimensions to the background as mere symptoms or as mere uh, feedbacks in a loop and uh, etc. Etc. Maybe Josef wants to. Uh, yes. What What can I uh, add to this? Uh, like um, uh, the idea, yeah, the, 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 the two traditions or the two genealogies. Um, the Richard uh, mentioned some something as like a remediation of theory, which of course uh, sounds strange. But uh, uh, this is this idea that uh, we as literary scholars basically can look reframe literary theoretical concepts that kind of look uh, that are important for us and kind of we see that uh, we can build on them in the context of the media theory as we kind of them re uh, partially retranslate them into another framework like so the remediation of course is a is a pun or something like that it's not really a remediation but retranslation of you know the uh, the great concepts and theories that we still consider like uh, inspiring in the literary theory uh, into this uh, into this uh, different context that uh, uh, that is uh, media theory and also there was one uh, very particular inspiration as for the genealogical uh, genealogical approach no and this was uh, this was uh, John Guillory's article uh, uh, Genesis of the media concept which is of course a great article it's a short I would say book in itself like it's very packed with uh, the the, gene the the genealogical the genealogical work f from Aristotle or pre Aristotelian I don't remember a Aristotle let's say to Benjamin no even to Jacobson and uh, and so on so it's a it's really great article it's a fantastic article and it kind of inspired us uh, uh, to yeah, methodologically uh, and conceptually, and inspire us to to look at the the problematics from this genealogical point of view. We uh, made this uh, this anthology of cultural materialist uh, thinking, and this this article was was translated into into Czech in this book in 2014. And we, uh, so it was not me; it was Richard and uh, uh, Tomáš who <laughs> decided to build on this. But we kind of uh, used uh, followed with this article like. It, it became some kind of seat for the 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 book or the the approach. So it's uh, there's a particular uh, genealogical article uh, by John Guillory behind uh, or in. It's it's actually very we refer to it very often, and it's kind of an, a conceptual or methodology and methodological access of of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, uh, Josef, for, for mentioning this, because this is really crucial, uh, because it's also a, a, a connection to, to NYU. But this is a coincidence, but uh, as you know, John Gallery um, uh, uh, works and teaches and uh, researches at NYU. And uh, but also, if we we, we looked at the um, a lot at the German tradition, but also the other 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 sort of contexts of uh, media theory, um, media thinking, and we also took some cues from from there. I'm, I would just like mentioning it because there is a certain inter sort of like international or certain like uh, uh, a certain well, a framework which aims to sort of uh, bring more traditions together uh, from different uh, sort of like local or vernacular contexts. So the, I, I guess we will come to that. But uh, there is also the work by Stefan Hoffmann, who is, which is also on the history of the media concept and Jens Schröter, who also wrote, uh, wrote uh, 
in his handbook, the Median Wissenschaft, there you also have um, sort of um, uh, information on this on this process of the uh, of the um, uh, of the importance of mediation as a as a as a concept and as a thing. <coughs> Yeah, I wanted to actually follow up on this the specific point because I was noticing and I've had a chance to look a little bit in the manuscript so I could be, you know, but I think it's very interesting to me like the um, you've brought together um, like a so there's the German media theory and then there's several schools of literary theory here. But the French are a little bit missing, no? And I was wondering if that's like an accident of just basically focusing on people who bring these two things together. And maybe you think, you know, I mean, they're not, of, of course, Jacobson ends up in Paris, so he's highly influential there. Um, but we have, it's, it's very interesting. We have semiotics, you know, once we have Kittler, we also have, you know, the whole post-structuralist tradition sort of built in. Um, and, and then we have, uh, you know, like these, are, so there's a little geographical thing going on there, which I think if you wrote this book in the United States, well, at least if you did it 10 years ago, <laughs> it would have been highly French, you know? Uh -huh. and, and I think there's maybe in this, I love the phrase, the end of the end of theory. I'm all for it. <laughs> it feels like it's the end of the end of history. We might as well have theory again. We need it. So um, like, uh, I'm just kind of curious, like if you think that's part of like a, a shift in genealogy that's happening or, or you know. No, uh, it's uh, it's maybe a little bit of a, a superficial uh, impression from the from the contents because there was there is um, there's uh, like a Leroux uh, oh, right. work is like really important in oh, one of the chapters. And Simondon even makes it. Into and Simondon. Uh, there are some names. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm the. Not criticizing. <laughs> so we have these names. I could. I I could go on, Leif, actually, about that. Uh, <laughs> it's not half of the book. Even, not even one, one quarter of the book is not French. No, it's not. But No, 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 it's not. Uh, yeah. But uh, there, is, uh, there is that, uh, that rereading of, uh, I think the, the rereading of uh, Leroy Gouran's uh, sort of uh, approach is, uh, is uh, one of the major parts. Also in the, in the context of the German theory, because there is uh, a rereading of the, of the um, operation change chains by uh, Rothschild belts, for instance, in the recursive operations and and uh, different sort of like anthropological approaches, which uh, claim that uh, we need to think about these exteriorizations as a part of a more complex uh, loops and uh, uh, and that th they are recursive. So this 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 line of thought, like a critique maybe of the regard, is like a very uh, very important in the in the book actually but i think it's super it's interesting like like structuralism and semiotics come very much to the fore here yeah yeah, yeah. and i think i thought maybe there's uh, the only reason i asked is because i thought maybe there is something there like these are the places where literature and and the medium concept encounter one another more substantially or something it was, uh, I guess it was not uh, uh, very intentional like uh, to, to, to omit uh, French sources and so on. And uh, there's this uh, important uh, line of uh, thought like, uh, yeah, Raghuran, Simon Don and anthropology and so on. Uh, there's also some some Derrida and some post-structuralism as well. Yeah, in the chapter "Let the Ghosts Come Back" by Jose Vojvodík on the spectrology, who combines kind of uh, you know this Derridian vein with uh, the and the negative anthropology, the, the German negative anthropology. So there's kind of uh, even these con sometimes perhaps crazy combinations. I don't know, but uh, hopefully, hopefully they work uh, of the different traditions. Uh, mm, yeah. I'd like to kind of follow up in, in something in the same direction. So one of the things that I found so exciting about the book is that um, you have a, a really middle European perspective and you use middle European resources that may not be familiar to those of us from the US. Um, so you're getting beyond what is often a set of contrasts or points of contact between an Anglophone critical tradition or plural traditions and German media philosophy um, with um, uh, you know these uh, excursions into into French theory. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, kind of point blank, if you could just teach us a little bit, uh, myself included, the Prague School. 
What, what, you know, tell us, what is this Prague school? Um, and how does it figure into the work you're doing with the um, media concept? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I'm going to teach you about the Prague School, uh, but uh, so obviously the Prague School is a is an important uh, point of reference for any literary scholar in the in the Czech Republic, and uh, and it's been reread and re uh, reinterpreted over and over again. Uh, but here it, I think, appears in a completely new light. So this is my uh, excuse to those who know very well what Prague School is and who would not probably think about Prague School as related to the questions of uh, what makes uh, literature medium or what constitutes the, the specific sort of like mediality of literature as a system. Uh, but um, which we nevertheless, or I hope that we show that there are one of the first sort of um, traces of a, of, a, of a true media literary theory uh, to, to be found. Uh, we could begin with formalism, but we decided to, to, to go with the Prague School, which is, I think, a little bit richer in that, in that respect. And um, well, uh, Leif has mentioned poetic function in Jakobson's article from uh, After the War. Uh, but as you know, the, the idea of aesthetic function has developed since the 1920s uh, and uh, through the 1930s. And that this idea has been transforming and taking shape in, in, different, in different contexts, especially not only in Jakobson's work, but especially in the work of Jan Mukarzewski. So Jan Mukarzewski is like a, is the uh, literary score of Prague structuralism, uh, who comes up with this idea of aesthetic function in a in a quite different way and quite anticipatory in many ways, um, thinking about the, uh, the, that function as a <clears throat> function that connects all functions <coughs> or all dimensions of a of a of an artifact in a transparent manner, making uh, sort of meaning turning turn on itself. Um, and it's it's uh, it's a it's a different uh, reading from 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 Jakobson's, a more contextual and uh, more concerned with uh, meaning and value and what makes uh, what makes us interested in those uh, kinds of works which seem to somehow activate uh, the turning of the sign on itself in a, in a way or the at, turn of the attention on the on maybe communication itself and the way we 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 create uh, uh, something which uh, something like a sign or super sign or some some uh, something like that and or either in art or in literature and the transparency of the of the aesthetic function I I think is still a very, very powerful, powerful idea because uh, it um, opens up our way of dealing with uh, with how meaning is is created. Um, and uh, another concept which is really important here is like the genesis of the idea of uh, intentionality, but unintentionality in art as well. So this is a, for here, it is a famous article from 1943, uh, Intentionality and Unintentionality in Art, where Mukoszewski uses an interesting concept of semantic gesture, which is, uh, which is a kind of unification. We talked about uh, particular and uh, universal, but also about holes uh, today. And uh, so his claim is that there is a, there is an, an, a, a tendency of unifying various levels of, uh, of a text uh, of, uh, of an aesthetic kind, let's say. Uh, but that the, the, the interesting thing is that this only happens against a sort of a counter motion, which he calls unintentionality. And um, he also claims that the, the, our way of seeing what is intentional and is, as uh, unintentional changes throughout history and gives many interesting examples from from art history, but also from literature. And this this I think is a is a you know one of the very you know inspirational and great uh, ideas 
which emerge from from within that tradition. But we also um, sort of try to extend that to uh, not so much to the French structuralism because there is a certain disconnect there from uh, from from what the Prague School was doing because what what they miss there it seems to us is a, a, is a certain dynamics or dialectics that is involved in the in uh, in the st in structure and the, for Mukatowski for instance the the idea of dialectics or of of dynamics of the sign is like crucial and this is not what we find in the French structuralism and there there is a lot of um, emphasis on on uh, synchronicity and of um, it, it's a diff very different system actually even though it's also called structuralism and of course Bart and uh, I don't know very down you name them they're they're you know they could be studied from this point of view like and and if you could find like uh, uh, so so interesting things but if we followed this line it led us a little bit in a different direction so going to Umberto Eco and his like semiotics and the way it developed in the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s and also to Yuri Lotman and his cultural semiotics. So I think this is the sort of like direction that it took, uh, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> which also returns back to the question that you asked. Can I? Yeah. Oh, no, yes. sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I just, I will just uh, follow up uh, very shortly. Actually, uh, this is uh, your, this is the chapter you wrote with uh, Pavel Shidak, a co-author on structure. So I perhaps shouldn't comment on it, but I just wanted to mention that, uh, of course, it was the avant-garde times, and it's it's basically avant-garde, um, avant-garde aesthetics. It was very, very. Although Mukhtarovsky wrote on you know uh, 19th century literature, even old uh, Czech literature and so on, but. Uh, the there's this uh, in these avant-garde times there's this uh, this um, this interest in different arts and setting different arts as arts not as uh, media but you can kind of, kind of transfer it to the media framework yeah so so we also built on on film theory um, on the, the theory of film on the theory of theater um, in, by Mukhtarovsky um, and Jakobson as well has something on, uh, some uh, text on film no and and, uh, but there are also other uh, other sources or other important authors that we uh, just, uh, if I'm not correct, just uh, tell me, like Petr Bogaterev or Jiří Valtrusky, who kind of, you know, uh, of course they were, um, it was the semiotics, uh, but at the same time they kind of uh, can be also transposed to this, uh, to this uh, media, to the media framework, which we perhaps didn't. Uh, we didn't really. Uh, you, you, did we use Bogatyrev? Yeah, we did. So uh, I just uh, sorry, uh, couldn't uh, couldn't uh, remember like, to what extent we we did or you did. So uh, even uh, going from different uh, from aesthetics of different media and tra transposing them like in this. Uh, in this re in this reframing gesture to the media framework it also it also we think it makes sense uh, makes sense and uh, there are interesting impulses so like uh, not just mukarovsky <laughs> It's a, it's a super interesting uh, uh, thing to have and a major thing for us to have this available to us in English because I think, you know, part of the end of theory is the historicization of theory, which we're seeing now in the United States. There's this book, French Theory at Yale, um, Redmond, I think his name is, uh, or like Steph Carolanus, our colleague Steph Carolanus's book, um, An Atheism That Is Not Humanist Emerges in French Thought. Really great academic title. Um, but, uh, uh, and I think... You know, one of the things that you see when you start to look at this historicization is you see a little bit, I'm going to exaggerate it, so, but that structuralism and post-structuralism came to the United States at the same time. We didn't have structuralism before we had post-structuralism to any significant ex extent. And the result was that theory almost immediately got kind of like taken up in comp lit, but also moved away from the concept of literature altogether. So that it became theory. It was just called theory, right? And mm -hmm. and then immediate theory was able to emerge from that in a way mm -hmm. across the the you know I mean Hitler was coming to the United States almost almost as soon as he was recognized, and then throughout the 90s. And I think that I don't know. It's it's sort of an interesting interaction because it doesn't like I love that there's a whole chapter on Lotman here, because this is somebody who has a beautiful text about AI, but also is like. You know, the work is all in this like deep, these deep readings of, of the Russian uh, 
uh, you know, literary text, like the whole thing, basically, it's, it's, it's an incredible amount of, of, uh, uh, learning that goes, that goes into that. So I was thinking out of that basis, like, uh, what was the big takeaway <laughs> for you when thinking through the media theoretical tradition about literature or did it, did it confirm some of the things you're saying about sort of the Prague school, not just the Prague school, but like, you know, this perspective having, you know, already treated literature as medium to, to a certain extent, or did it lead to like new syntheses for you or like, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the sort of recurring problems for literary theory is, uh, is, um, <clears throat> let's say, uh, an, uh, a non-material concept of the sign in the in the semiotic tradition, and that that uh, uh, the, that fact actually is countered in the unintentionally the idea in many ways, because this is also like part of the like material if aspect of like the the the, the artifact, and uh, so that returned uh, as a as a kind of tension between these traditions and obviously the the uh, absence of techniques that like, techniques was not never or technology was never a uh, semiotic well uh, it, it is more complex than that but uh, it, there was no let's say systematic um, account of what technology does in order to construct a certain semiotic entity um, uh, you know what was uh, what is the uh, how do we technically construct the sign? So that that was not part of the uh, has not been part of the semiotic tradition. This is something that we where we are looking at uh, obviously at uh, other places, beginning with Hitler, for instance. Who, on the other hand, again I'm, I, I guess I'm jumping a little bit ahead, doesn't have a concept of the sign to put it very simply, or doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a very a very uh, developed um, uh, well sort of works in such a way that the semiotic di dimension is uh, is reduced to a certain to a certain effect perhaps and uh, uh, so, so to bring these two tr traditions together also meant to re read them against the grain which was the idea from the beginning in a way uh, perhaps uh, yeah uh, also this um, uh, this uh, idea uh, that uh, you really need to think systematically that uh, when for for instance mukarovsky uh, compares the uh, different arts etc there is no um, there's no um, well of course uh, semiotics can be a base for this but like uh, thinking uh, thinking the arts as media like uh, and f uh, looking for the <laughs> a, a concept or a theory uh, of course it's not one it's not one sentence definition <laughs> but uh, l l the need to look at it systematically like or that was that was at the, this was our intention as a, as as a media that kind of have different uh, different uh, forms of relationships etc that was also uh, also important this was uh, this was uh, present this is present especially in the last chapter on intermediality which is which is quite long because intermediality of course has been with us for quite a while as a as a concept and so on or inter art studies and that's the that's again the gene genealogy of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, way of looking at at literature but uh, especially in this chapter uh, uh, we deal with the of course uh, um, the the need to find some basis some general concept of a medium in order to be to compare because again it uh, the authors Alice Lichkova and Stanja Fedlova Fedrova they demonstrated, you know, there was intermediality, but there was not actually a strong concept of medium in the theory of intermediality. Yeah. So uh, also this, uh, just uh, just uh, a note on on this. Yeah, and this was this was partly because the the the, the concept of the arts was taken for granted in in a way, and uh, so this was not looking for the thing in the middle. I should also say that we are. <coughs> that uh, Tomasz, who is not here, has been working a lot on the German uh, um, uh, 
uh, rereading, for instance, of McLuhan in Hartmut Winkler's uh, work, and that also I think for him especially was very inspirational. Um, um, because it's again as a rereading of me uh, of Hitler actually and and McLuhan as well McLuhan especially in the in the semiotic uh, um, direction and the, in the direction of taking account of uh, let's say meaning ecologies or something like that how meaning is created in in in, in certain communities and in certain uh, circuits or com uh, uh, contexts. Thanks so much. It's um, uh, exciting that you're bringing up intermediality, which I do. I think is another thing that does not have a lot of purchase in U.S. in in media studies. Um, it's more it's kind of European concern, so it's it's nice to have that you know kind of put in dialogue with things. But Richard, I'm super glad that you use the term material. Um, coming out of media history, I'm just a lot more secure um, when we think about the materiality of the sign. Um, so I think you know, given the occasion that brings uh, those of us from New York to to, um, uh, to you, um, we just have to give you an opportunity to think, you know, about digital media, really about about you know, techniques um, in their contemporary form and kind of what that again thinking about the moment in which you're publishing this book, um, how does your book speak to this technical moment? Yeah, so I will. I think well, there are, there are many chapters uh, that actually deal with this directly. So there is a chapter on techniques and media. It's, this this is the name of that chapter. It's quite long, and it's about the uh, development of the idea of uh, uh, techniques as a as a as a as a certain well projection of the unconscious. Let's say, and it's Tomas there begins with and cup, not surprisingly, and I'm glad that we have the editors of the English translation of and. Cup, uh, Cup's work, Jeffrey and uh, Leith here. So this is this is a, 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 a turning point um, where Tomasz begins. Uh, I have uh, concentrated on that interesting moment where information theory and cybernetics have transformed semiotics in the Jakobson's work. That's where I begin, and uh, but it leads into a, a, little, a little bit un. un uh, predictable directions, I think, uh, uh, from there. Uh, but uh, so I, <clears throat> I'm looking at the way uh, in Jacobson's model of communication, there are certain, uh, there I identify, well, I, I don't want to go too, into too much detail, but I identify sort of like three different versions of, of like the communication model and that there are like in a certain tension there, um, the transmission model, the structural model and the, the uh, I don't know what the third one model now is, but uh, there is a. Uh, um, I, I will remember. Uh, there is. Um, there is. So th there is that moment, and uh, so I compare these traditions and what information theory sort of brings into the table, and what cybernetics brings into the table, and uh, also what the, how this informs in problematic ways the work of Umberto Eco, whom uh, we have not so much heard about in, for instance, in our discussions, but I think his work and the open work from 1962, which then he work, reworked into, uh, in 1965, and actually the way he reworked this is like, very important in that genealogy that I sort of uh, bring up. Um, is is crucial to exactly um, uh, that um, uh, interference between um, taking information as a <clears throat> sort of dimensionless entity or as a, something which is de divided, de 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 divorced from meaning, um, and how uh, let's say this sort of re sort of transforms the whole the whole idea. Of, of what uh, communication uh, is and could be, and from there I go to experimental poetry, which again I read in like this in this way, and and uh, and uh, I find uh, like interesting moments in several interesting moments because experimental poetry, of course, and experimental literature of the 1950s and 1960s reacts 
to, uh, I mean, uh, sort of draws from the first avant-garde, and so we can find all kinds of visual poems and calligrams and experiments of this kind uh, in um, in uh, in the tradition of literature going back to uh, Simias of Rhodes and so on through Baroque uh, uh, sort of meditative poems to to the first avant-garde, of course, and Mallarmé before that, and so on. But so the question is, what makes it specific? And there. Um, I think the information theory and cybernetics uh, inspiration is crucial in, in many ways because this changes the the way we uh, the way I think the, 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 the these poets or these experimentalists actually view their work itself and uh, the way we read it also so I think they are purposefully creating a different sort of like kind of reading which is uh, which is uh, well for one thing it is not from left to right they are like not only that they are visual poems or that they are visual things but they, they somehow like disturb that kind of reading and uh, they make the eye wor uh, sort of move in, a, in strange directions which is more reminiscent of like looking at a visual object but and the, on the other hand at the same time the visual side <clears throat> of like our attention is uh, subordinated to look for the, to, to the need to reconstruct the verbal meaning so we have a, like a strange like asymmetrical matrix uh, emer emerging there like alienating the the acts of reading and seeing from the usual from the usual way and i, I and i think the, the way to understand and this i think is actually important for 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 today as well because we uh, may be reading differently and i think that this whole question of reading is actually important uh, for for Yosef as well and for me um, we may be reading differently we may be uh, paying attention differently to, uh, and this seems to anticipate a certain uh, certain uh, certain certain mode of certain modes of attention and reading which uh, but in a in a in a in a uh, deliberate intentional way, uh, with a certain artistic gravity or with a certain intention to say something about uh, the nature of communication, such the nature of poetry, uh, by sort of like short circuiting the dimension of communication and meta communication, and so uh, all this sort of like should come together in also like in in relation to what happens to to semiotics and to to uh, in in, in uh, combination with uh, cybernetics and uh, information theory. I think if you would uh, like this, this chapter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Just uh, perhaps a short follow up. Uh, yeah, but it kind of combines what was said before and what was said now uh, that uh, this, this genealogical approach and this, I would say, theoretical historical approach where you actually look at the theories in, the, in a particular context, like, you know, Echo in the 1960s, for instance, and, you know, Mukashevsky in the 1930s and so on. So, as well as the experimental poetry from the 60s. So, uh, this, this sensitivity towards exactly the genealogy, which is a time relation and uh, to, you know, looking at uh, specific, uh, I would say, um, uh, specific historical points that can be really inspirational in a, as a particular stage of, for instance, uh, uh, development of theory, but also development of literature as the experimental poetry, of course, in the context of uh, the studies of electronic literature and so on, you always encounter uh, this experimental uh, experimental poetry, like the older from the older stages, like which was not uh, not uh, digital, but which was you 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 find it you find it there, but uh, we kind of try to. Uh, yeah, uh, so you find it also in our in our work in the relay in in the context of this, what Leaf uh, mentioned, like as the sensitivity towards the theoretical but also historical, the histo historic um, um, historicizing theory or looking at theory at a particular context, like the neo avant garde in the nineteen sixties, Echo and so on, and like so, uh, and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, if I can just follow up there. First of all, yeah, I'm very excited about this chapter, and I think um, I I think it's super interesting to see that semiotics is coming out so strongly there because I think um, part of not to be the you know the one ragging on the the way that theory was taken up in the United States, but but even in France, I think the Telkel group 
really fell in with semiology. You see the early Kristeva doing this and, and whatever her husband's name was. And, uh, and Soler. Soler, thank you. And, uh, and, and, and then of course it passes on. And then you get almost the impression like trained in theory as I was, comparative literature, the program is called literary theory. Uh, I barely learned that Jakobsen had any semiotics in his program. So it's, it's, it's so fantastic to see then this whole other world open up where you have Echo, whatever, of course, and then also Lotman. And I was wondering if in that context, just as you know, following up on Lisa's question about, about the digital, because um, I've seen you write about this before, Richard, but I wonder if it does, do you, is there some, some information aesthetics that comes out here? Because this is another place where in Germany, at least you get this fusing of, you know, semiotics and yeah. digital. Um, and I think literary theory in an older guise would have rejected it out of hand almost precisely for the reason that it was said, you know, for the linguistic turn reason. Semiology is great as long as it's language. But once it gets outside, you know, then people get very nervous about it. And it's so great to see all of these historical resources being brought to bear on that question, which is undeniably important now, but which one could perhaps have, have ignored in the 60s or 70s, you know? Yeah, so uh, that's funny to bring, bring it up because Benze was uh, one of those uh, information like <clears throat> proponents of something like information aesthetics and he was very um, sort of influential here through the work of these experimentalists like Josef Herschel and Bohumila Gregorova. So he's like, he, they were, he was translated here, his textual or text semiotics was translated into Czech very so soon and it's actually... still not translated in English. In English and yeah, I know because we've been... Him in the We're working on it. Secondary sources on him. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And it's an expanded yeah. edition in Czech. So it's funny because the, the German edition is, is the Czech edition is actually the the the, the, the real one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like no, I'm just a little bit. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that line also leads to well, I don't want to take too much time, but leads to to Lotman and um, his ideas on artificial intelligence. And uh, so there is a bit on. On, on LLMs there, where I read, I think there are some interesting similarities to what we talked about today in in relation what Alex Galway was saying in relation to the monad, because the uh, Lotman has this idea of semiosphere, and that, that's, that's a monad really. In, in uh, there is no there is no duality in it, and. Uh, and that's a semiotic uh, continuity or con a, a semiotic co a continual space. And uh, so um, the way he looks at <clears throat> artificial in intelligence is, is, is interesting also because he's using the, the, the concept of a function. So he's like di distinguishing various functions that the cult culture has. And, you know, this allows us, I think, uh, it's a kind of like rudimentary, but still a conceptual framework, which might, which is helpful to think about uh, LLMs as, as well in semiotic terms. So for instance, I have this idea that there, you remember the secondary semiotic systems, uh, the secondary semiotic systems are using, uh, are those that use other semiotic system as their, as their primary one. So literature is an example of a secondary uh, semiotic system because it's using language, which is it's itself a semiotic system. So my claim is that uh, LLMs represent something like an order semiotic semiotic system or third order semiotic system. And I think it's a little bit in line with what I think you are saying uh, about meaning and information um, in your in your talk at the workshop. <clears throat> okay, but well, we have been hogging the microphone and yapping for an hour. Um, so we want to let you all uh, comment or question, but um, before we do that, I just wanted to make sure that we give um, uh, Joseph and, and Richard an opportunity to reflect on what it's like to write a book with seven authors. Um, <laughs> and I know that we, that we're honored to have the translator as well in the in the room. So just you know a kind of softball question, but could you say something about you know how you do that? Yeah, and actually I have to say there were eight eight persons. So and I have to uh, mention my colleague and dear friend Pavel Shidak, who was the author co-author of the Prague School chapter and. Uh, so that should not be uh, 
uh, not mentioned. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> so it's it really the opportunity was like the uh, grant project that we had here at the institute from something which is called Grant Agency of the Czech Republic. And it's always a tense moment when uh, you try to get grants, and it's not, it's not uh, different here. But it gives you a, it gives gave us um, uh, time, space, and and so on uh, to meet as a team, discuss um, uh, where we are going. Which uh, not much time actually. Not much that much. <laughs> That's true. But whatever, whatever time we would have, I think it would not be enough. So uh, so Alice Edlicko, Stanja Fedrova, Josef, uh, me, and Tomáš Kudy, I think were the most and Pavel Shirak were meeting here regularly. But also joined sometimes by Josef Vojvodík from the from Charles Felkuty and uh, Miroslav Petříček as well, um, and um, so so yeah so this was uh, this was and we, so there was a, lo a whole process of like commenting and rereading and and reworking and so on so uh, so this 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 is this wasn't this isn't important because it's not just like some kind of edited uh, edited work but uh, really. Um, a collaborative. You know, often you say something about collaboration, but here it was really, it was real. Uh, and of course, then when this was all done, then we uh, were at this. You know, we were facing the task of like slimming it down, uh, uh, and of course translating it. And then that's where Peter Gaffney, who is here and who I'm sort of. Uh, welcoming here um, came in and uh, with also with Nick Orsillo so there we have two translations but Peter was uh, was the main and uh, and so we've been working on this I, I guess maybe Peter, Peter would, would you like to say a few words about the wonderful process that we made <laughs> no, it was really difficult <laughs> well maybe uh, are there any specific questions about the translation that I could address so I, is there's a uh, as you're speaking, of course, I'm remembering almost every moment of the process, and I, I, my, my head is kind of swimming with all the things that um, you know that we did. Well, I just know that like the process of literary translation is like a completely different thing from the process of technical translation, which arguably many of these chapters will involve technical stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, was there any particular challenge to like balancing? I, I know this is not you know, first order literature, but there must, you know, there are, there's like this engagement, right? So was there some balance between finding in something just with this number of authors being talked about too? I mean, you have trans existing translations of Lotman, you have existing translations of Jakobsen and so on, you know, and just Jakobsen by himself is like 17 languages. So were there sort of between the technical and the literary and all the existing translations, particular challenges? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were some, I think it was a lot of the time I, I didn't have to worry about that. Um, that. Things were going pretty well. And, and then we had some some conflicts about whether the, the language was technical enough. So in fact, your question is kind of spot on with, with what we discovered ourselves. Um, and I mean, from my point of view, I don't know. I, 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 I was, some of the things you said resonate with me because I studied in America, in, in Philadelphia, and uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you too. Yeah, just after that. But yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I, I studied with Jean-Michel Rabaté and, uh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is like a, a kind of a, um, a UNESCO joke uh, <laughs> in the making. Um, no, so I, I mean, I, I I approach language. I, I'm always thinking about um, you know the kind of Lacanian, Deleuzian uh, uh, engagement with language as something that does things, you know, or maybe more Deleuzian than Lacanian. But you know, the idea of a book uh, is not something that tells you or that represents things or or it means something. It does something. You know, the book is a machine, and I I I, I find I believe that so strongly. I've I've spent my my uh, career thinking that so strongly that I, I it, maybe this project forced me to stop and think about that a bit because I, I as a translator I, I usually assume that the what it needs to do is is it, it needs to have the same uh, a reader a native English reader should uh, have it should have the same the book should have the same effect on a native English reader as it would on a reader in, in its original language a native speaker of the reader. so but this is an assumption I make, and I, and I and it's because it's become second nature. 
And I think there are moments when you have to wonder what is specific about the medium itself and, and that languages are different, but still, to what extent, I mean, for just to give a very technical example, if you're translating, you're thinking about what something means in the context. But if you do that too much, you don't, you, you can ignore the, the ways in which writers are working against the context or doing something surprising with language that, that, that where you might miss that if you're paying too much attention to context. So that, that was difficult, yeah. I mean, there were times when I had to really wonder what is it that these authors have done th that maybe um, is uh, surprising uh, within the theme or argument that they're making. And so, yeah, sometimes th th there was a, a reaction uh, that that one, two of the articles that or two of the chapters that I translated should be more technical, and clo more closely follow the original language. So that that did happen. I would just say, uh, the, part of the reason I asked is that uh, when when Jeffrey and I did the cop thing, we were working with this wonderful translator, Lauren, and I mean that text was just sediment of you know 19th century technical terminology and it was fun but it was also super hard to kind of you know dig all that stuff out and, and sort of make decisions about you know where is this going to land with a contemporary english speaker versus you know yeah so are we what should we say oh <laughs> i think we should uh, we should uh, give the room to the to to the audience to you to to ask us anything that comes to your mind, following up from the, from this. Any comments, any questions? I guess questions first and then comments. Do you want me to <laughs> the microphone? I can walk the microphone around. Question yeah. uh, so you constantly discuss your translation with the authors, yeah? Is that so? Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. No. Well, the, the, maybe I should point something out that, that this is a kind of a unique situation or unique for me anyway, that the authors knew English so well that we were able to go through many iterations and revisions yeah, together. So, right, it was, it was a really, um, it was a great process actually. It was, we, we all, I mean, I learned a lot yeah, really going through with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other questions, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll kick it off with this uh, meta question. I, I'm really excited for this idea of the end of the end of theory. And uh, <laughs> um, if I understood correctly, uh, there's, um, the part of this end of theory is the, the fact that it's been historicized and uh, you, as sort of a counter movement towards that, suggest uh, remediation. Then you you corrected it to retranslation or uh, something like that. So could you maybe specify what does it mean to put this theory into new context and kind of make it, if I understand it right, uh, alive or useful again? Or what what does it mean? <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a pun, uh, of course, uh, the end of the end of theory, but it sounds good. Uh, what uh, what to say? Um, uh, yeah, we kind of wanted to, you know, have this two way process of the two branches of theoretical thinking, just uh, one played out against the other and like uh, spe spe specifically or like bringing the, uh, the, um, the literary theory into the framework of uh, media theory. But um, I don't know uh, the end of the end of theory. Uh, sorry? And vice versa. And vice versa. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was told. And uh, so... Uh, I, I'm for me uh, actually I don't think they will um, I don't need any end to an end or or nothing like that just uh, I would uh, I would like to think about it more dialectically like as for the theoretical I don't know because it's you know who has a panoramic uh, point of view like what's the, the theory now like which theory theory where perhaps you know so but uh, anyway there have been these um, these discussions uh, or uh, especially in literary theory uh, we are uh, the end of theory was basically we commented on it in literary theory basically yeah so 
So these, there have been these discussions on about the end of theory, of course, uh, Terry Eagleton 2004, like uh, after theory, and there have been so many in intelligent, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, John Gillory published his book, Professing Criticism, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is a great book, like a uh, great, fantastic uh, take on like these discussions, actually, and where the situation is right now of literature, of, of teaching literature, reading literature, and so on. So, uh, yeah, but uh, like personally for me, uh, of course we want to do theory, but we also have some readings of uh, literary and text and other cultural artifacts in the book, actually like extensive readings, I would say. And we also would like to kind of uh, 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 take it as a, uh, or the, this theory that we are kind of building as uh, as something that can be useful for reading of literary text in this in this different context. Yeah. So for me, like uh, it's a uh, I uh, like the today's. Uh, if I would, uh, if I if I should, uh, you know, um, somehow generalize. So I think that uh, uh, today's uh, uh, literary scholarship is very much uh, text centered. It's very much uh, history uh, history centered. It's not that much uh, theory centered, like as it as it used to be. And I'm very happy with it. Uh, so I don't don't need you know to the end of the end, but I would like to you know bring some interesting concepts into this this way of doing uh, doing literary scholarship. So the end of the end is too much for me, but it sounds good. So why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if, if I can <clears throat> just add uh, that, like, if one were to like write today, write uh, media theory of literature, we could try to do that. But um, but what we really end up, ended up with is like the necessity to do a different kind of like project because to write a, like a new poetics for today is like for for. For us, it seems impossible without doing this kind of uh, remediation or this kind of genealogical form of uh, of theory to, to 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 go from there. So this is like a I don't know, like a first step. Uh, so the, the last chapter is like a final essay by the collective of the authors, which is called uh, Steps to a Media Theory of Literature, with an allusion to Bateson. And uh, so this is like, um, like a summary of, of, of our findings, which come from, you know, so many different like, like approaches and, and frameworks and so on, which I think needs to be there. But it's like, um, you know, it's really the first step or something like that. So Hi, well, thanks a lot. I felt like in a, you know, complete revision course, it was fascinating. Um, my comment it's not a question my comment comes more from perhaps a misunderstanding of the invitation for this event because i thought you were inviting people to come and you know maybe raise issues which could be included into the book but maybe this is an inspiration for a second volume <laughs> um i always ask my students what is it that we need theory for right there's always this silence and you can always answer this question for yourself but uh, I'm trying to explain to them that we need theory in order to understand the words we are using in order to tell a certain story. Okay, And I think it would be fascinating if we can have a project or a volume, and I'm misusing Lisa's <laughs> presence in this audience. Uh, say, I have a, I have a case study of uh, uh, the usage or appropriation of paper shortage in the cultural management of the 1950s early communist regimes as a major tool of controlling literary communication. So here we go, intermediality, materiality, and so on and so forth. And I, it'd be, I think, fascinating if we can put together a way of using particular empirical material, a particular story, and ask to which extent that particular empirical story can be told or retold or rethought in terms of theoretical frameworks, be it media, media related or literary related to a certain realm, if you wish. So this is just in thought. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for this. And uh, the, I mean, obviously there are many historical projects uh, here and <laughs> elsewhere which deal with either directly or indirectly with uh, with uh, with topics that are you know directly related to, to, to our effort. So um, the uh, there is, for instance, a, a project on the history of reading in the in uh, in the uh, was that. In the, in the institute, <laughs> in the institute, yeah. but also and in, in, as a historical project, so it's uh, it's it's concentrated on the uh, on the establishment of communities and different different kinds of readings in in the 18th century. So th there are these historical projects which obviously, like we need to know uh, if we are going to say anything of uh, in 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 terms of um, uh, conceptual value or or our abstraction and so on. But uh, so this is not like deductive. Research what you're doing but we're replacing uh, the history of theory in in the in in the history that we're in, in particular context historical context that we are interested in so actually it's a historicizing of theory in, in many ways and and I think the, here the efforts come together I think or might come together in many ways Yes, uh, thank you for a brilliant co co in the, in the, uh, co in the introduction to the, to the book. I have just two minor questions here. Uh, first, if you say if you, you, I'm completely outside of the media studies um, uh, field myself, uh, but uh, I was just wondering. You mentioned once that uh, um, there is a group of so-called Kittler Jugends. Um, uh, the followers and, and, and the pupils of, of Kittler. So I just wonder if you can make this, uh, if, you, if, you say, if you could say a few words, a few more words on this and say um, as about also another completely naive question uh, to the translator himself, perhaps. Um, I wonder if in the, if in the uh, paradigm and or era of, of Deeple and, and Google translators and so on, what is what is the role, apart from editing, editorial work, what is the, 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 the work for, what is the task of translator here? Oh, this might be a question for, for, for yourself. Thank you. It's after the translator, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think um, there's so much room within even without translation for understanding how a theoretical text is supposed to make meaning um, based on whatever context you you pair it with and I think um, maybe the this is one place where machine translators they they tend to try to find and, and I don't know exactly how they work these days but I imagine they're doing something like um, they are they have some kind of algorithm where they can or neural network system where they can learn from uses of language every time everywhere it appears in the internet um, but because of that vast generalization of the way that language is translated by a machine it, it doesn't have i mean maybe it will this is just a matter of time before it can do this but it doesn't have the ability to, to hone in on a specific context and to make judgments about why this context not that one or when a context is changing or i don't know there there are situations where obviously anybody who who speaks more than one language will know where one word can mean many different things and that can be scaled up to a sentence to a paragraph to a gesture um, at any size and so i i guess that would be my answer i mean i i i think that the technical problem of translating one word into another is is just the beginning and and then there's a lot more work after that <laughs> so yeah on the kidler you can maybe just an, just a note that like this uh, this is um labeled by their enemies right this is not how they call themselves but uh, we are well so there is a there is a um, there is a line which we are interested in and the work of ben hard Ziegert, for instance is like very important for us and the idea of cultural techniques 
I think goes in that direct in simple in, in in the directions that we sort of like that makes sense us to, in, in to in in this in this project. So um, and the so some of you know what I'm talking about, or many of you, and uh, and even you you've uh, you have met probably when uh, some of you. So uh, but on the on the translation, just wanted to uh, to to say that it was uh, like I've never worked so intensely with um, the the confrontation of two languages two texts in before and I've translated myself from English to Czech and I've edited translations but I've never worked so intensely on a text and it seems and and uh, so we have really made many many rounds with Peter like trying to find find the way uh, for, because Peter wrote beautiful <laughs> beautiful text which 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 uh, but it was not what I wanted to say in in certain <laughs> in certain points and 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 it was, but, but there were like passages where I was thinking, "This is so be so beautiful," and it's it was and it was very it was a different kind of thinking. Obviously, like it's a the, the Czech and English like work very differently in terms of word order, in terms of uh, uh, we call it well, word order is is not the only thing, but it's like a combination of rhythm and theme is like an absolutely different uh, world. And so the train the 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 train of thought is like I. Really Realize that we think really differently because our thoughts like move in different directions like you know it's and if you connect the sentences it doesn't work if you if you you know if you follow up the the Czech version so um, we've tried also I've tried using like jet GPT for instance like and other other models like to to find out what, what it would, would would come out and obviously you know it sounds again. It sounds. It sounds like. Um, it sounds very generic in the first place. Like the the prose that comes out. So that's that's. I think one of, one of the uh, one of the things that um, I don't know where. Well, whatever. It's uh, no, this is not about uh, Alan's now and translation of that. But this is uh, this was. Um, we couldn't use it simply because the editing would be so so uh, so so you know so vast so mm, intense that uh, that we you know that it was just better to try to 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 work like this it, between a human and a human loop uh, rather than editing the the machine translated text so far uh, as for the uh, the human uh, the human uh, uh, translation uh, uh, what is interesting, like even in uh, you, you know it, like uh, when we have some scholarly text translated, that uh, there are different styles. It's very interesting that you know good translators translate uh, the even scholarly texts which are supposed to be. Of course, this is a myth, or not. It's not even in, uh, no one's even an animal professing it. I guess that they are kind of you know just notional texts that don't have any specific style. They have style, and the translations also have style. So when we have uh, several very good translations, uh, very good translations they will do different styles of the translation which I think is very interesting because you can say okay so I want some neutral style yeah but the all of course but the author uh, him her, her, her himself also doesn't have a neutral style yeah so there's always this kind of style which I think which is also a style of thinking which is also a style of uh, of uh, whatever feeling uh, which is also important moment in uh, in scholarly work uh, I guess like uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this kind of this kind of thing so uh, yeah uh, it's a it's it's a matter of style which is not a superficial aspect of the text, but which is a very important uh, aspect of even the scholarly scholarly text. Hmm. Yeah, I would. I mean, Kafka is a particularly big example in English where the translations have been super controversial in how they get the German across. You know, so I think that we have several different Kafkas in English. I think it would be very interesting if you wrote an article. On this co co cooperation with the translator, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so we may have reached the end of the conversation. Uh, wanted to again congratulate uh, the many authors, translator, um, and and thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>